they're perfectly productive members of society. Last week we had Bill Gates for dinner here and he said that he has a ridiculous amount of money and it's so hard <laughs> to find appropriate ways to do good with the money. Yeah. So what does money mean for you being the first person uh, in history uh, that has uh, a net worth of a uh, three digit amount of billion? The only way that I can see to uh, deploy this much financial resource is by converting my Amazon winnings into space travel. Yes, folks, that is Jeffrey Bezos. That's the second time we've had that as a cold open. <laughs> but uh, I, I can't get enough of it, honestly. Um, can't think of any use for his resource. How about uh, drills for safety? Yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously I've kind of tipped the first uh, uh, segment of the show. But hello, David. Welcome to Left Reckoning. I'm a little bit salty. Hey, man. I mean, as you should be. And Matt and I are going to be taking some time up at the top to talk about what happened in Kentucky and Illinois. Um, and a problem that unfortunately is not just limited to, to Amazon, but is endemic. Uh, to the system of, of capitalism, which puts profits over people every damn time. Um, I don't know, something that is just so unnatural um, that you sort of have to force people to not do what you would do for the vast majority of human history uh, when something like a tornado or a natural disaster is hitting your community, which would typically be take shelter and wait it out. Uh, capitalism is a really nasty system that actually tries to deny our very basic humanity and force people to work through it. Um, we'll get to that in, in a moment. Um, we got a lot to go get to, man. I'm really looking forward to this episode. Um, in just a few minutes, we're going to be premiering our conversation with Lies of Featherstone, um, something that both Matt, both Matt and I have been looking for, someone who both Matt and I have been looking forward to having on the show for a very long time. Uh, we're going to be talking about masculinity and the left, um, a little bit about Josh Howley, why the right wing is trying to use this kind of feeling of anxiety about men and masculinity in this country for their own purposes. I don't know, a very rich conversation I'm looking forward to sharing with yeah, you all. We go, we go all the way from Teddy Roosevelt to uh, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, so yeah, that's it's, true. It's a pretty classic left reckoning conversation, actually. Ben would be proud. Um <laughs> And then after that, Matt is going to bring us through um, a quick uh, South Dakota update. Um, their favorite governor up there um, has been up to some pretty nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a viral clip I have at a Sioux Falls Stampede uh, hockey game, uh, which, I mean, I enjoy minor league hockey, great stuff. Um, but it was of teachers <laughs> scrabbling for cash on a blanket on the ice. So it wasn't like their knees weren't getting cold or anything like that, but Put it in the context of some other um, educational priorities, shall we call them, that Chris mm -hmm. Nome has. Uh, yeah, uh, look forward to another South Dakota update, folks. Yeah, and then after that, we're going to be talking about Julian Assange and why it's a very, very simple call uh, for democracy. But before we get to all of that, let's we have to talk about the, these these tornadoes, which, you know... We're going to focus on the labor aspect of them, but absolute solidarity with all the people who've been affected. I mean, they have been um, extremely devastating um, and and historic. And I'm just hoping um, that the government is able to provide an adequate uh, response to those who are in need um, in, in in this in this like very very difficult time. But we want to focus on this really nasty system of, of, of capitalism and how it has failed so many, but in this particular case, um, failed a handful of workers who lost their whole lives. Yeah, so first I want to start uh, with reading the names of the confirmed victims, and I'm mm -hmm. sure particularly in the uh, Mayfield case, uh, if that's the final number. Um, but just to start off with, so for at this uh, consumer pro Mayfield Consumer Products uh, Factory, we have Devin Burton, a 21-year-old, Kayla Smith, a 30-year-old, Lannis Joe Ward, a 36-year-old, Robert Daniel, 47-year-old, Janine Johnson-Williams, a 50-year-old, Ivan Lopez, 51, and Jeff Creason, 57. Uh, and then for the Edwardsville, Illinois, Amazon, um, identified victims we have is 26-year-old Austin J. McEwen, 28-year-old DeAndre Morrow, 29-year-old Clayton Lynn Cope, 34-year-old Etheria S. Hebb, 46-year-old uh, Larry E. Verdon, 62-year-old Kevin D. Dickey, 33-year-old, 34-year-old uh, Etheria Hebb, uh, mother of a uh, one-year-old child. 
that she was mm-hmm. away from on the you know the, the stormy night um, because I uh, you know got to got to work for Jeff Bezos um, and uh, I think the thing to comment on with the uh, Amazon factory is a little bit simpler. Uh, mm-hmm. Ken Klippenstein has an article after deadly warehouse collapse. Amazon workers say that you receive virtually no emergency training. Uh, Amazon employees have been discouraged from taking time off for natural disasters because it would slow down production. And Ken uh, has this uh, uh, quote from a Slack taken a few days after, uh, or the day after. I know it's the weekend and Amazon was busy blasting Michael Strahan and other wealthy people into space, but can we get any kind of statement about the mass casualty incident in Illinois, the employee wrote on Saturday afternoon. I feel something could be said or a plan of action to review and severe weather uh, safety could be announced and that we had live tornadoes touch down. Now, those, the people that were killed in the Amazon warehouse were sheltering uh, in a, uh, uh, a south bank of uh of bathrooms it looks like that collapsed uh, it wasn't safe for them to be sheltered mm-hmm. there. and um and i think this point about drills right is like these people said they'd never had drills uh um one of several posts of the company's internal voices of associates message board um reflects a concern expressed by a dozen amazon employees who spoke of the lack of workplace safety afforded to workers across the country not just related to extreme weather events but to hazards in general many workers all of whom requested an anonymity to protect their jobs said they had never had a tornado or even a fire drill over the course of their careers at amazon dating back up to six years mm. i mean and, and there's a lot to talk about you know specifically about dealing with th- this problem but it also has to be noted in this in this case uh, in, in illinois uh, that the and the, the ken the ken Klippenstein piece also notes this as well uh, that the company itself did not re- um, know what was going on at the facility internally they found out from the media like everybody else which means there is just a severe breakdown uh, when it comes to safety protocols. Some of the other whistleblowers um, who you know who spoke about Amazon's safety protocols uh, were noting that they had been sort of raising the alarm about this problem for months and in some cases years about the fact that there are not significant um, or and it's substantial enough safety protocols or training for these kind of uh, natural disasters. On top of all of that, the excuse that you get from Amazon on this is that it's hard to schedule. It's hard to schedule um, a kind of basic safety drill because, you know, there's so much turnover at the facilities, right? Which, again, is a labor problem that comes with, you know, Amazon's brutal treatment of of, of people, right? I mean, yeah. workplace safety, this is simple stuff. And I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to share this because it, it really does hit at the heart of this problem that I think, you know, like there's a specific technical things that you can do to deal with disasters, right? Um, and, and even like the most well-meaning company can mess this up potentially, right? Because it's something that's sort of outside of the norm of expectations. Um, but when you are constantly getting people saying, we are failing at this, we are not prepared for this thing, um, you know, that happens in this part of the world, that happens in this part of the country, and you ignore it, um, that is a systemic failure. That is you putting your profits over over people. Um, and these kind of text messages that, uh, you know, we saw um, circulating on, on social media. Uh, this is Larry Vernon, who, who Matt noted earlier. Um, these are some of the last messages that he sent out um, to loved ones. Uh, well, I'll be home after the storm. What do you mean? Amazon won't let us leave. Um, you know, then the, the heartbroken message is what you're doing. I hope everything is okay. I love you. Um, that's the kind of like we can talk with people who know more about disaster preparedness right about like what kind of protocols you can put in place but it's that lack of freedom right there that is like the fundamental issue here um where where people's lives are just sort of thought about you know after the fact um and not proactively enough when people were saying they were are worried about what's coming um, and they're sort of told that they're not allowed to leave the facility, a facility, not, not because the facility was providing them with safety, 
right? Like it'd be one thing if they're sort of like locked down in a safe space, you know, and they're sort of saying like, you know, we actually can't let you because it's not safe to be on the highway right now, right? This is literally, we don't want you to be off of your shift because we can send you right back to work after we get an all clear that the tornado has passed. Um, you know, we don't want to interrupt our, our, our supply chain um, at, at a moment like this. I mean, this is absolutely despicable and anti-human. Yeah, the, ex exactly. But because uh, to they'll they like to have the PR line. Oh, it's safer for them to stay at work, right? Well, it's like first of all, make it their fucking choice. But mm -hmm. also, you're not even doing the bare fucking minimum. And it should be noted, like you said, like there there's no federal standards for factory safety shelters like this, which is mm -hmm. an abomination. And there was this 2004 story, uh, another Illinois. I can't remember exactly what city, but it was applauding this uh, fact, uh, this uh, this uh, war warehouse owner about that it, their warehouse got hit by a tornado, but they actually had the good safety things. It's like, oh, look, it is mm -hmm. a good example. You got to federally enforce it. Mm -hmm. it, can't, it can't be that 2004 article didn't influence all these factory owners to be like, oh, yeah, I really care about that. that. They're like, nah, every one of those factory, other factory owners is like, mine's not going to get hit by a fucking tornado. And if it does, you know what? It's not really going to be my issue there anyway. What, what, what's really going to hit me? So, I, I mean, yeah. Because because the the calculus that these companies make um, is that people will forget these folks' names and people will forget this this uh, this this episode. Um, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's truly. I mean, I think the most uh, I mean the most indicting thing is the fact that people died at work and were sort of forced to be there. Right. Um, the second most indicting thing on the Amazon case is the fact that there was lack of like kind of oversight uh, nationally. Um, you know, throughout the company um, on these kind of safety issues that they didn't even have the direct lines of communication to even figure out what's happening at those facilities, right? So at that point, what's going on on the shop floor? Well, people are sort of the managers and the the administrators who I think are, are, are culpable just as much as the company, don't get me wrong, um, but they're operating from a logic that they're taught and that starts all the way at Jeff Bezos, right? A logic that, you know, life is cheap, People are expendable. People effectively are robots and tools for you to use, um, um, and not a kind of human-centered, um, you know, perspective where you would say, "Well, it's very frightening that there's a very serious tornado coming in." We're going to talk about um, th what happened in Kentucky, and then at the end, a little bit about um, some of the things that make tornado deaths like this even more indicting. I think. Um, but you really do have to start there that like within the corporation of Amazon itself, there are people within it saying our safety standards are not up to, to snuff. We're afraid to speak out because we can get fired for that because Amazon is incredibly um, brutal when it comes to whistleblowers. Um, and then the fact that people just do not effectively are, are sort of denied their freedom on the shop floor to make you know basic safety decisions for themselves. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just want to note because it's a, unfortunately it's a very similar um, story in in Kentucky at this candle factory, and I don't have the name of, of the candle uh, corporation in front of me right now. But yeah, Mayfield eight people. Consumer Products is the at least the factory uh, mm. it looks like so. So Mayfield, um, you know, the, this candle factory in Kentucky, they also have fatalities. Eight people died, um, and the thing that makes this story. Um, so damning is the fact that we do have more on the ground reports from this, at least right now. Um, workers were um, denied to go. So two tornadoes passed, right? The first one, workers were denied to go home by their, by their management. And after the first one passed, some people left. They left because they didn't feel safe. They left because they were worried about what happened in their community. They were left because they wanted to be with their families. Um, they were told, the company denies this, but now multiple workers have come forward and say, said, these workers were told that if they leave, they are likely to be fired, right? It literally was a your job or your life kind of um deal that these that these managers were putting up in front of people again that's the managers for sure but that starts all the way at the top of, of a company when you start to create a culture that works like that um again people left and they said i'm you know screw this i don't care about this job i'm going to like do what's best for for my safety but i don't know like matt you know we talked about this before like have you you know we talked about a couple weeks ago about you know the kind of lack of autonomy that you felt when you had a shift manager at one point flip a coin to decide if you got to go home or not um you know have you ever had that kind of experience like when it comes to like you know safety or like major events like that where i don't know someone's sort of lording their control over your ability to make basic kind of decisions about your life and safety 
No, I, I feel lucky to not have it. The only thing that comes close is like, I feel like I was um, a bit when I was a bit more naive and like, you know, working uh, uh, in college at like a coffee shop and it would be like a, a blizzard day. I would t think I was like doing some sort of super heroic thing by offering to come open that morning uh, because I'd be willing to drive through the snow. But mm. but like that is obviously like I, I've never been like held someplace where like you like where you want to go home like to something mm -hmm. like, yeah i mean no i don't have anything that compares to this i mean the thing is like a lot of construction stuff when the weather was inclement like you know they're just shutting it down just because they can't work in the rain or, or something like that when i was right. bartending i mean i had a few pretty nasty snowstorms where it's like you know i don't want to like risk i can't get to work um, in the first place, uh, because if they've shut down all the trains and the buses, I have no way to get there. Um, and, and two, it's like, I don't want to get there and just serve. Like, I'm sure it might even be busy because the people who live around there who live upstairs might, you know, want to come down for a beer, but like, I don't want to have to be in a kind of situation, um, where I'm unable to get home yeah. at the end of the day because, you know, they shut down the trains or the buses. Um, and, you know, I was told flat out at a couple places I worked that you have to, you have to come in regardless and I ended up having to stay at somebody else's house, not being able to go home at the end of the day. Um, obviously the much worse outcomes as we were talking about earlier than that. Um, but it's just that, that kind of fundamental lack of, of freedom and safety um, that, that is, is brought into these kind of relations, you know, because you, you have to be able to provide an income for yourself and your family in this system. Um, and, you know, I know some people like I understand, like sort of identifying with the kind of people who are saying I'm leaving right um, at that at that moment. But, you know, it's a lot easier to say that kind of shit in the hypothetical. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, like we should cultivate and encourage the kind of mentality that says to the bosses, no, screw you. But don't do that at, at a point that sort of, you know. Uh, is that the expense of the other people who are essentially were forced to continue being at work, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is you can, you, you, you can say in that moment, I would have gone home. But the truth is, <laughs> tornado warnings happened a lot, right? Like, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is like, it, so it has to be a collective thing where one, you make sure you have an option where if you do want to stay, you're fucking safe. Um, mm -hmm. And and then, yeah, like, I, um. And you are fully informed. I mean, that's the thing of the lack of responsibility. Like, what the fuck is the point of, well, we know what the point is from a capitalist perspective, right? Uh, is that that lack of responsibility is money in Jeff Bezos's fucking rockets, right? That he doesn't, that they don't care, like, to know exactly what's going on at all their uh, warehouses when there's inclement weather like that. That's because that would cost a lot of fucking money. Making sure all these warehouses that they rent are fitted out with safe places for these to go, that costs a lot of fucking money. Stopping stopping people so they can learn where to go in case one of these tornadoes in Illinois and or Kentucky, places that get tornadoes, stopping production for so these new employees so they can know, like, oh, should I go to those bathrooms or should I, should I go to this ones? Like, that costs money. And, uh, yeah, I kind of got off on one there, but, um, it, 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 that's the only reason why it's these deaths uh, are, uh, that's money in Amazon's bank. Absolutely. No, for sure. And, um, I, I just wanted to know sort of in closing that when it comes to, um, when it comes to these very, very frequent natural disasters that are coming because of the climate crisis, uh, we, we have to note that we are getting a lot better, though, at predicting the severity um, and, and, and uh, of, of things like tornadoes, right? So mm. we're at a point right now, and there's an article this morning in the New York Times where we're virtually at like 100% accuracy when it comes to our ability uh, to predict uh, uh, tornadoes. It's not, um, you can't predict them like way in advance, but you're getting a 15, 20 minute lead time. So when you're in areas that are sort of facing the crisis of, you know, big tornadoes like that, um, these kind of failures, these are systemic failures. Like these are failures of like the safety systems in place at workplaces, right? Not of our ability to be able to predict these things. Um, and, and I think that that makes it even more indictment. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I wasn't aware of how exactly like, yeah, I mean, and, and, and again, like, Amazon, of course, the the company that controls the data centers for the CIA and all that shit, right? They this is fully within their capabilities, and they just didn't not going to do it. We'll see if they, see if the government makes them. Yeah. 
Well, y'all, um, we're going to be, uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back and uh, premiere this conversation w- between us and Liza Featherstone. Um, we might have to figure out some technical stuff too, Matt. Um, but uh, make sure, please, consider joining us on patreon.com slash love reckoning. We have a really exciting uh, second part of our Lennon conversation premiering this Sunday. The first bit was Lennon teaches you Marx. Um, and this second bit is Lennon's letter to the American working class. Uh, so you'll get that on Sunday if you're a patron. Uh, you know, it'd be, it means a lot to us, all the support that we've got. We're approaching 50 episodes, looking forward uh, to the next 50 as well. We're going to be putting out a survey, I think, later this week, too, for all the people who have been supporting us across the, the past year um, to sort of see what people have been liking, what things maybe people want to see changed, any ideas, topics, d- you know, different structures for the show, etc. Uh, so be looking out for that. I really look forward to hearing from all of you. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I think levels should be just about fixed now, if that was the uh, issue. Um, cool. But, uh, yeah. We'll be uh, back with uh, Liza Featherstone and uh, be back. And uh, after that, about 45 minutes, uh, South Dakota and Assange. <laughs> the only con- <laughs> We're the only show that's combining those two things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. See you, folks. <laughs> Uh, welcome back, uh, Left Reckoners. David Griscom here, as always, uh, joined by Matt Leck. Um, and this week, we're really excited to be joined um, by Liza Featherstone, a columnist at Jacobin Magazine, contributing writer at The Nation, and author of the really great book, Divining uh, Desire, Focus Groups in the Culture of Consultation. Eliza, thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us this afternoon. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I mean, um, I mean you know, there's, there's so much... Uh, to talk about, I mean, this has been a very funny uh, news day, but we wanted to zoom out a little bit because you wrote a really great piece um, in the New York Times about a subject, you know, that, that that I think is important to this project here at Left Reckoning, but also a lot of the kind of work that we're doing at, at TMBS. Uh, the piece is called Josh Halley and the Republican Obsession uh, with Manliness. And we're seeing, especially in right-wing politics, there's so much anxiety about men and, and masculinity and this kind of shift in our culture. Um, I, I think your piece sort of uh, did a good job uh, analyzing it. But just to start us off, you know, why do you think there is so much uh, anxiety around masculinity, not just with the right, but I guess maybe in general in American culture right now? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, it like there's there's it's certainly a continuity. I mean, like we always, you know, um, we, we always have cultural anxiety about <laughs> masculinity. Um, you know, basically for um, you know, for for as for as long as we've even named gender and gender mm-hmm. roles, um, there's been there's been anxiety about the um, um the masculine side of it, um, but. I think that um, it's a particular flashpoint now for a couple of reasons. Um, one is um, for um, for decades, um, men's men have been um, losing privilege in the society um, in a couple of ways. Um, one is um, um, one, and and some of these are due to social progress, and some of these are due to um, assault um, by capital um, that affects everybody, but affects men in a couple specific ways. Um, so um, the part that is due to progress is that um, you know men is that um, you know due to some feminist advances, um, men are losing privilege at home and in mm-hmm. personal relationships. They're not um, you know they're they're not automatically the boss of a heterosexual relationship or a, um, or a nuclear family. Um, that's um, obviously, I mean, <laughs> to, the, to those of us who are feminists, that's good. In the larger <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and to those of us who are, you know, who were ever children, you know, thinking back on it, <laughs> it's, it's good. Yeah. You know, um, like we don't want to live in, in, in the patriarchal world. Mm-hmm. Um, the um the 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 other piece of it is that um um that as part of um of capitals all around 
um, assault on um, on ordinary mm. people um, over the um, you know over the last few decades. Um, the the um, men bear a particular um, brunt of that as men have lost um, um, lost out on manufacturing jobs, which once um, gave many men um, decent wages, um, mm-hmm. but, but also allowed men to make things. Um, there's sort of, um, that there's a, a real concrete, um, like pride that a lot of people took in, you know, in, ma- in making things that everyone could see and mm-hmm. use. Um, and also that really, and also a sense of really contributing to thriving and prosperous communities. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, as, um, as, you know, those, um, as, as those jobs have disappeared, a lot of um, not only um, survival um, has, um, you know, men have been left grappling for survival, but also um, for that sense of purpose and that sense of a, of a clear um, place in society, as well as um, for that, that clear sense of how to support families and how to have a, a role um, as, um, as a breadwinner. And then, you know, there's also um, the, um, then there's also the larger question um, as, as our culture evolves, you know, in n- not only um, in feminist ways, but also in, in, in ways where we're, we're kind of um, questioning gender, mm-hmm. all of which I think is good, um, mm-hmm. but that all, that's, that accentuates the feeling for um, men that they don't necessarily know what they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to be, and um, and for many men, this can feel like an added, like kind of assault on their identity. And so, so what what I'd say is, it's like, um, you know, some of this is coming from changes that we on the left would consider good, mm-hmm. and some of this is coming from from changes that we on the left can all agree are um, not good, like the general assault on ordinary people. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in a little bit later, we're going to talk about how sort of the left can sort of address this anxiety. But, you know, the thing is with the, the right wing, and, and in a minute, we'll play some clips of, of Halley specifically, but the thing is for the right is that like, the work getting worked up about masculinity, um, or like this crisis of masculinity, men aren't men anymore. Um, you know, it's not particularly new thing, as you noted earlier. But for but for the right, it's like an answer that is sort of like waiting for a question, if that makes sense, like they can sort of provide it like men are no longer manly today. And that's why you're feeling so lost. And, you know, that's yeah. why job, you know, it's hard to find a job, right? Right. You're not you're not strong enough. You can't buck up. Um, yeah. But I, I, I mean, I would have to I, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you think about this, because even though this is a kind of older trope and I know Matt knows um, you know, a lot about Teddy Roosevelt on this kind of thing. This is an older trope for the right wing, um, but it does seem like it's really bubbled up over the past couple of years. Absolutely, and globally so. Mm, I mean, yeah, that's an interesting we, point too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we see all over the world in Brazil, <laughs> Bolsonaro. You know, somebody who I've never seen more pictures of somebody at death's door. Um, by the way, you know, sort of trying to be this international symbol of like male virility or something like this. Very funny to me. I know. Well, same with Trump. I mean, you know, he was exactly. almost, he, he almost died of the coronavirus that he was too much for a man to wear a mask against, you know, I mean, this stuff is dangerous, uh, but yeah, um, so the, so we see it as really a global phenomenon because the, the things that I'm describing are in no way unique to the United States, mm-hmm. I mean, both um, like the, um, the assault on ordinary people's ability to um, be the breadwinner of their houses, of their households, but then also the um the sort of sense of social progress that questions male privilege and you know and and masculinity you know and and those those things are you know that those things are global and that's why we see the rise of Mm. these sort of strong men um like these um you know i mean they, they don't they're not necessarily all dictators they're not necessarily all autocrats we can't use the same word but one thing they really have in common is this 
um, use of masculinity as a flashpoint. I'm really interested by the like the gilded. Age. This is a gilded age sort of phenomenon. So like looking back, and yeah. Holly you know, uh, tries to you know, bring in the Teddy Roosevelt legacy, and you look at all the different things that were going on. You have the um, uh, uh, suffragettes. Uh, you have, um, mm. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff like the Oscar Wilde stuff. Uh, going on in England at the mm-hmm. time, like this, yeah. this crisis. Like, talk about the. I guess, like, maybe you've touched on it a little bit, but it does seem like a a crisis that uh, is really big in a gilded age. And last time we reacted in the way that we it cemented all these things. This is uh, we went socially backwards in a response yeah. to it, and now we're kind of undoing the previous gilded age's masculinity crisis response. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, the, I think that one of the um, one of the issues was. Um, at that time, um, the, um, the 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 transition from um, from a, an ag- agrarian society to a more urbanized one um, was really um, you know causing a, a, a widespread crisis. Um, I mean, not um, I mean not in in the sense that you know that um, you know of well, what are men supposed to be doing? You right. know, like if the if if the if the the role of men was to you know work the land, um, and now you know they're going to cities, and you know and, you know everyone's job is kind of more similar. You know you know it's like there that there are less prescribed gender roles. Um, mm-hmm. Like like women are going to work also. You know and and um, and you know a, a sort of a, a sense that you know as a society like. Um, like we're we're kind of um, like losing something in that process, um, and um, you know, and and for for Roosevelt, it was um, he was really able to mobilize those anxieties to um, tell a story um, that uh, about. Um, what we needed to do about national purpose. Mm. Um, his idea of national purpose was horrifying. I mean, it was like, you know, um, um, imperialism and conquest. Like, let's go kill lots of people in the Philippines um, and um, and um, and um, indigenous people here in the United States. Uh, I mean, just sort of ex- like expansionism and. Mm. Um, you know, and a real, um, a, a very racist and violent vision of how um, American men were going to be redeemed, um, and um, and um, you know, and so I, I think that we're, we're in a sort of a similar moment now, where there's a lot of anxiety about um, men's changing role and mm-hmm. you know, and changing place um, in the culture. And in in the economy and in their families, um, and um, and Holly is really mobilizing that um, again toward a very right wing um, and um, and and racist. Um, Bear with us, folks. Uh, We will try to be right back with the rest of this interview here.
Okay, folks, so we're going to resume from here. Apologies for that. Uh, Streamlabs crashed. So uh, anyway, here we go. The Oscar Wilde stuff uh, going on in England at the time. Like, this, yeah. this crisis, like, talk about, the, I guess, like, maybe you've touched on it a little bit, but it does seem like a, a crisis that uh, is really big in a Gilded Age. And last time we reacted in the way that we, it cemented all these things. This is, uh, we went socially backwards in a response yeah. to it. And now we're kind of undoing the previous Gilded Age's masculinity crisis response. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, you know, the, I think that one of the um, one of the issues was um, at that time, um, the, um, the 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 transition from um, from a, an ag agrarian society to a more urbanized one um, was really, um, you know, causing a, a widespread crisis. Um, I mean, not um, I mean, not in in the sense that you know that um, you know of well, what are men supposed to be doing? You right. know, like if the if if the if the the role of men was to you know work the land, um, and now you know they're going to cities, and you know and, you know everyone's job is kind of more similar. You know, you know it's like there that there are less prescribed gender roles. Um, mm -hmm. like, like women are going to work also, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, a, a sort of a, a sense that, you know, as a society, like, um, like we're, we're kind of, um, like losing something in that process. Um, and, um, you know, and, and for, for Roosevelt, it was, um, he was really able to mobilize those anxieties to, um, tell a story, um, that, uh, about, um, what we needed to do about national purpose. Mm -hmm. um, his idea of national purpose was horrifying. I mean, it was like, you know, um, um, imperialism and conquest, like let's go kill lots of people in the Philippines um, and, um, and, um, and um, indigenous people here in the United States. Uh, I mean, just sort of ex like expansionism and, mm. um, you know, and a real, um, a, a very racist and violent vision of how um, American men were going to be redeemed. Um, and, um, and, um, you know, and so I, I think that we're, we're in a sort of a similar moment now where there's a lot of anxiety about um, men's changing role and, mm -hmm. you know, and changing place um, in the culture and in, in the economy and in their families. Um, and, um, and Holly is really mobilizing that um, again toward a very right wing um, and, um, and and racist um, vision um, of of what um, you know of of, of what our, our society should be. Interestingly, Holly's own book about Teddy Roosevelt um, uh, is fascinating because um, he wrote this, it, he, he published it um, way back in 2008 um, before he was a right-wing politician. Um, mm. And, um, and he's very, um, he's very critical. He's very critic. He's critical of, um, uh, he, he basically calls Roosevelt a white supremacist. Um, you wow. know, and, and he's very critical of that. It's like, part of the like, woke mob coming for Teddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, it's so interesting. And, um, and, um, and also criticizes the idea, um, that, um, masculinity should be, um, achieved through violence, you know, and this is somebody mm. who, flash forward and he's giving the January 6th guys a thumbs up, you know, <laughs> a, a lot has changed. You know, I mean, and so he's, it, it's a, it is sort of um, uh, really interesting to me that um, somebody wrote this very thoughtful and critical biography and he's in effect um, becoming the very thing that he, he critiqued. And, yeah. Actually, he awesome. figured out that actually that works. <laughs> I guess yeah. something about this. <laughs> Maybe I should just do that. It's like Tucker Carlson. There's a clip in like 2001 where he's criticizing Bill O'Reilly saying he's not the like guy that you think he is the log cabin mm. sort of guy. And then later he's just like, actually he's not that, but I'm not that either. And that actually pays really well. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway. yeah that's well, right. 
Let's introduce this Holly clip because it's worth the hearing him in his own words. The, the framing is fascinating. Um, and like, the editing is, is also fascinating. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I will play this. Senator, you gave a pretty hot speech at the National Conservatism Conference in Orlando. You talked about the <laughs> left's attack on men of America. Yeah. Why masculinity as your new big issue? Well, I think what the left is doing is attacking America. They're saying that America is systemically oppressive and men are systemically responsible. What's a man to you? Paint a picture. What's a man? Well, a man is a father, a man is a husband, a man is somebody who takes responsibility. As conservatives, we've got to call men back to responsibility. We've got to say that spending your time not working, and we have more and more men who are not working, spending your time on video games, spending your time watching porn online while doing nothing is not good for you, your family, or this country. So a viewer's watching this and they're thinking, really, what the liberals are doing are going to push me to watch Pornhub more or play Donkey Kong more? Do you mean that literally? <laughs> well, what I mean literally is that I think the liberal attack, the left-wing attack on manhood says to men, you're part of the problem. It says that your, your masculinity is inherently problematic. It's inherently oppressive. What's your basis for linking that to what liberals or the left, as you would say, do? Is that based on data or based on a hunch? Well, it's policy over many years. I mean, if you look at the policy of deindustrialization, those are policy choices Mike pursued over many years. I've looked wait, wait, how does that connect to porn? Oh, well, you've got, you've got men, 16 million men, Mike, who are idle, who don't have anything to do. Now, partly that's their own responsibility, but also partly it's because jobs have dried up in many cities across America and rural areas, too. I think you put together lack of jobs, you put together fatherlessness, you put together the social messages that we teach our kids in school. I think we confront that and its effects. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, um, he, Josh Hawley is obviously, um, you know, extremely right wing, um, mm -hmm. if not a fascist. I mean, I think he is basically a, a you know, a, like he, he has fascistic politics. Um, but he's, you know, the interviewer is being sort of willfully obtuse there and, um, and Hawley is giving him a materialist analysis of what's going on. You know, mm -hmm. like, you know, he's saying, look, you know, if people don't have jobs, people are not making a good living. Um, you know, he wants to just blame them because he's conservative, but he knows, yeah. <laughs> you know, because he's that's like, a funny catch when he says that though, about yeah. their responsibility, yeah, but yeah, also, of yeah, it's their fault. <laughs> Cause that's what we have to say. We're right wingers, but he's actually a serious person. He's studied history. He knows mm -hmm. there's a material reason for this. Um, and you know, and that's, you know, and he's, he's, he's saying it. Yeah, it's, it's just it's a very interesting moment. The, the, the thing where he says, like, the um, it's inherently bad, it's very similar to the critical race theory of saying white people are inherently uh, uh, a racist, right? And and that, that sort of, like, you're bad. They're saying you're bad. It's basically that that's the fundamental message. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Fascinating. Yeah, it is. It is fascinating. And the thing is, I mean, it, it's so easy to laugh at it um, because it is. Really, I mean, it, it is funny. Like, of course, like that. Uh, um, and and the thing about the the thing about you know watching porn and playing video games all day. Um, but um, you know, the, there is. I mean, like there, there is, there is a sense that um, men are um, men are adrift, um, mm -hmm. and um, and he's, and when he says liberals are telling men that they're the problem, um, I think he's not wrong uh, um, about that. Yeah, I mean, this sort of leads us in, into this this next bit, which I think is 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 really important. I think there's two sides of it. There's like talking about like men as in like older men and then like, you know, young guys as they're sort of getting in, in, into like manhood or, you know, adulthood, however you want to phrase it. Um, but maybe just starting on like the, you know, the men who are not taking responsibility, right? Um, you know, the, according to Halley, the people who aren't working, the people who are idle. Mm -hmm. um, I do think one thing that's like, it is really notable though, that like he, uh, what's frightening to me about this whole movement on the right wing is that they point to something that a lot of people can sort of recognize and feel, right? Which is that, you know, the world sort of does seem out of whack, right? It doesn't seem like, um, it's that easy to sort of work the kind of traditional jobs that you, you know, could, could find and, yeah. um, you know, and raise a family on. There's a lot of anxiety that goes along with that. And also, yeah. um, and I want to ask, I'm make this as broad as, as
as possible to hear your opinion on this because we want to talk basically why the left has such a hard time talking about it um, but i want to know just one thing on like what holly is talking about is idleness and all of these um you know these uh you know kind of feelings of anxiety that you know men have or just people have frankly you know um is <clears throat> something that i think some leftists especially like people in our camp the socialist camp has um with like work and like self-value right mm -hmm. um you know i'm all about reducing the working hours um as, as much as possible but you know a lot of people do get value from feeling that they're contributing to society and yeah. i don't know like i don't feel what worries me about him is like he can point out some of these problems and then we can laugh at him because his solutions are basically be responsible but I don't feel like we are articulating a great message as to how to address the, the fundamental problem. We're one that's attractive, right. frankly. No, um, that's that's exactly right. And um, and you know, he's he uh, that that's what really scared me about it was mm -hmm. that the uh, that he is identifying um, something that is real, and um, you know, and you know, like middle aged mothers um, do not want to see their sons playing video games and watching porn all day and you know somebody who's saying look this isn't this isn't how it should be and your sons should have a sense of purpose um, is going to be a lot more appealing than a bunch of elite la liberals who are laughing and saying like oh no like watching porn is not a problem you know, yeah you know, I mean, I'm not saying that watching porn is terrible but in excess I mean like you know mothers raising sons you know know that if they're doing that too much there's something wrong it's know? clearly a symptom of society not unable to produce meaning for folks yeah um, I'm, I'm curious uh, your perspective on this porn issue though because uh, holly brought it up steven crowder's uh show today is about how billy eilish um uh how billy eilish is finally right about something and it's uh it, she's saying about how she watched too much porn when she was younger and i'm curious like what you're what you the porn issue seems to be one that they think that they can really speak to people on um I, i'm just curious because it seems uh, that seems a little bit counterintuitive from them as like the free speech warriors uh yeah. don't censor us uh sort of thing like I, i'm curious what your what your take on that is i mean if they lean on that too heavily it's gonna blow up in their face because americans like their liberties um but um but but as 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 one example um, of many as, as it, which is really the way that Holly is approaching it, to be honest. Um, I mean, as one example among many of how um, many men are socially maladjusted, um, I, I think it's going to resonate. Right. You, know, you know, that it's, it's just like not proposing to take it away, not saying that it's the root of all evil, but just, but just like video games, like if you're doing that too much, it's because you don't have enough to do. Right. Or drugs for uh, often. In yeah. That too. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I think also that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting thing to, for Holly to bring up in a way because it, it, it sort of taps into, um, the, like, it's it's like if if men are watching porn all day there's something missing from their real lives like mm -hmm. and and the, and and that's that's true of um it's true of video games true too but the porn is kind of a deeper critique because in some ways because it's like oh what's actually missing from their real lives is like an a actual sexuality like and and that's like something that you know people uh, like in their heart of hearts know is important um, you know like that people actually people know that it's important to um um to you know ha be out in the world having real relationships and mm -hmm. there's something that is disturbing about the um, extent the extent to which like you know, young men might be struggling with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and because I want to take, make sure that we're, you know, saving some time in the last half to sort of talk about our side, because I think that that's where like the value of this conversation yeah. can really be so we can change, you know, build a better movement. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, to sort of maybe carry us there, um, you know, when we're talking about Hallie and these kind of, I don't know, paragons of like right wing masculinity or whatever, um, you know, could you just sort of help people who might not be really familiar with the difference between 
these two ideas um uh, understand the kind of difference between like a liberal feminist response like in the beginning of your new york times piece you notice like the kind of like you know snickering and laughing and, and dunking that's coming from you know more like yeah. liberal feminist circles versus a social um, feminist circle though i must say is not immune to to wanting to to dunk on these guys too because they're very goofy sure. um but they're could you help us ideologically good. understand the you know the difference between those two school of thoughts and how it applies here yeah, absolutely. So I think that's I think that's absolutely at the heart of of um, my reaction to this. I mean, I, I think that um, it, the the whole episode um, somewhat illustrates how um, liberal feminism just doesn't really have anything to offer men, um, and um, and you know, it's. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it, like it's it's nice that lots of um, men um, do subscribe to liberal feminism, you know, because they're good, decent people, and you know they think that um, everyone should, um, you know, have human rights. Um, but um, but if you think about it, um, the um, this the the message um, you are going to lose privilege in your home and in the labor market. Um, and, um, um, and, you, you know, and uh, like everything about you is under question <laughs> and suspicion. And then, um, what do you get back from that? And, and liberalism doesn't really have any answer to the, what do you get back um, in return? Because, um, because liberalism views, um, the um, the world and the economy as a zero sum game. So um, so so for liberal feminism, the problem is there is a scarcity of of goods. There's a scarcity of opportunity. Um, there's a scarcity of jobs, um, and um, you know only a certain number of people um, can um, be in the one percent or even the ten percent, um, and um, and the problem for liberal feminism is that women are disadvantaged in that rat race. So by definition, helping women to advance um, is, um, is going to um, push men out. That's just how it works because you are looking at um, something that is a zero sum game because liberal feminism accepts capitalism exactly as it is. Um, so, um, what would, what would men get out of that? I mean, there's like, there, you know, that it's, it, again, it's nice that, um, some men are willing to subscribe to liberal feminism. I don't want to discourage them, but it, but it helps. But when we look at it that way, it helps to understand us to understand why so many would not, you know, or so, or why so many men might be hostile to that um, vision. Um, and on the other hand, um, socialist feminism um, says, um, you know, we're um, 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 we're comrades in struggle. We are all fighting for um, a different arrangement, one in which we could all thrive and prosper, one in which we don't accept the scarcity. We don't accept a scarcity. We don't accept a class society in which um, in in which um, everything good is hoarded by a few. Um, we're um, we want to um, redistribute that for the many um, to um, to enjoy and um, and to feast upon. You know, so that's um, and and within that. Um, we need to look at, you know, making sure that um, that um, women are treated as human beings, and that um, and that the um, that all the social reproduction does not fall um, on you know uh, on on us to perform, you know that um, um, and you know that we are um, we're, that we're. Um, making our new societal arrangements in a way um, that um, um, that are um, are gender gender equal and um, and 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 humane, um, and that you know we're and that we're um, rethinking um, everything about our labor, but we're rethinking that um, with the goal of a society um, where all um, can um, can thrive and prosper. And I think that that's, um, 
I think that's really different. I think socialist feminism has a lot more to offer men. <laughs> and we don't really come out and say that because, um, you know, I'm honestly, um, I'm not sure why, but, um, but I, th- I think there's, um, there's such a hegemony or ar- uh, like around liberal feminism that it mm-hmm. almost makes it hard to, um, articulate why socialist feminism is, is better for um, for men, but I think it is, and I think that um, in in the scheme of things, um, that's one of many reasons why socialist feminism is more promising. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's and also more threatening. And more too. threatening, exactly, and which is why they always have to um, try to make this go away. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, because I just want to note that, like, you know, a, a, a part of this, at least from people I see around me, like, like I, I think that socialist feminism not only is true, it's like much more radical, um, and it actually does want to like hit at the heart of a lot of these kind of like gender-based yeah. inequities and and, and patriarchy um, versus a kind of more liberal feminism, which just you know wants to give the keys to a few more folks, right? Which again is more just than a than a completely exclusive boys club or like wait, you know what you know what I mean? Um, but it's 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 far and away less so than you know emancipation, you know, for for the vast majority of people. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I agree with you too. I mean, and, and this is the this gets to like this this last bit. I mean, like you know, dealing with this crisis of of masculinity. I mean, not to talk too much about myself, but you know, I grew up with a you know single mother uh, without a father. Um, and one thing that worries me about um, these kind of right wing characters is I see it happening like in my community, like younger guys that I know, because I grew up not only with just a single mother, but also in like the queer community um, in the South. Right. So I was in between two worlds. One's kind of like very radical left wing and then, you know, more conservative um, kind of thing. Right. And I was in between both of those because I was a guy who played sports or like country music. You know, I was like mm-hmm. I fit in with a lot of folks, um, but at home I was getting something very different um, and trying to figure out how what what being a man was to me was, you know, was a, was a personal journey. And luckily I had a lot of folks mm-hmm. to sort of help me out with that. Um, but I see other people who sort of, you know, might come in from a situation where like they don't, for example, have a father figure and they start looking for these people and the right wing, I just find them, they're always there waiting um, oh. to sort of answer those kind of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't see that same kind of interest um, on the left. And I think it's because, there's a, a, people are very uncomfortable sort of um i don't know i mean <clears throat> um you know sort of i don't know holding up that that kind of space i mean a very specific example is like you know you have to learn how to shave your face when you get to a certain age being a young guy on the internet i go and i type in how to shave my face and i went on this website didn't think too much about it but a few years ago i went and looked it up right what it was and it was crazy town you know far right you know men's rights stuff but yeah. they're waiting there for it and I, again i don't see yeah. us doing that enough on the left yeah um, no that's those demands right. seriously no that's absolutely right and um and all the all that right wing youtube um stuff is really i mean like i have a son and you know he is really into sports and mm-hmm. they um all, like all those youtube al- algorithms like will steer him to really um right wing um content because you know they're they're just like you know, it, like you seem to be a white guy who watches a lot of hockey clips. Let us show you, um, you know, why, um, you know, why vaccines are going to like castrate you or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> and I mean, I think so. There, there's the macro kind of political point, And I think that, you know, the first one is that like to sort of I mean, because the if we focus on this as like a question of masculinity, what Halley is doing, right? I think it can be a bit of a mistake, right? Because what Halley is, is sort of he's speaking to like a general like anxiety amongst like working class people, right? right? And I think gendering that too much, you can get into tricky territory. Um, but the answer to Halley is to just to be the ones who like we own the space of coming up with solutions to deindustrialization so much that Halley's saying, yeah, it's pornography um, and all these other things just seems as absurd um, as it is. I think the absence from that conversation politically is something that's really hurting us. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and, and I, I think um, it was interesting that, um, I mean, when Trump was running in 2016, 
um, he emphasized that deindustrialization stuff so much. It was one of mm-hmm. the reasons. It was definitely one of the reasons he won. Um, you know, and you know, I think that um, you know people forget that. Um, you know that. Um, you know that like like that a lot of the time he was actually talking uh, about these economic issues as they hit men especially um mm-hmm. and you know, and he wasn't just you know fulminating about the wall although he was certainly doing that as well um but yeah i i think that i, I think that i think that we on the left can do a, a much better job um for one um uh, one issue is um i i think um, we can probably be um, more, a little more subtle in how we talk about it. You know that there is, um, that there is sort of this, um, you know, this this tendency at um, um, at um, at misandry where, you know, you, you're just um, um, like where you know men are are are, are, are supposed to sort of. Um, you know, like disappear um, mm-hmm. in, in liberal politics, um, and uh, and you know, and also I think a sense that of um, being under suspicion, where like it it it, it like it it sometimes seems as if um, every liberal politician is always being accused of something, you know, and um, and you know that that there's um that that there's kind of an an atmosphere in which um in in which from the democrat from the liberal side um men seem to be under suspicion and of course some of that is um very um you know very valid reckoning with mm-hmm. um you know a history of sexual violence and um and sexism um but um but 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 some of it is like a like an overheated atmosphere that i think isn't coming off very well isn't projecting very well into the larger culture um, and yeah and I, I but i also think in the in a larger sense like we need to be talking a lot more about the real solutions to the real material problems that that holly is exploiting i mean and um and and some of that is you know stuff that the left is already doing but our our rhetoric and storytelling needs to be a little bit more inclusive about who benefits. Mm. But like you know, so you know the um, the Green New Deal obviously would really help men. We should not let um, them cast it as like some kind of um, you know. Um, you know, a, like plot to take away your hamburgers and your and 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 your SUVs. It's like, um, you know, that th- like like this is like definitely a policy uh, which men would concretely benefit from, and um, and we kind of we need to kind of take back the cultural signifying around that, um, so that it's not, um, um, it's so that it's it's not um, so feminized. Um, and like, and uh, I mean, and then, I mean, just sort of as a, a small example, I mean, this is more, um, on the, on the mainstream Democrat side, but, um, no, it really actually isn't. It was really, um, it was, it was really the sort of left Democrat side as well. I mean, as Biden was rolling out this infrastructure bill, this is mm-hmm. a, another example. I mean, you, so you'd think, okay, this is really great because infrastructure um, is, you know, offers is it offers both a national sense of purpose in the sort of Teddy Roosevelt um, framing, um, and um, and also, um, you know, traditionally masculine jobs, which obviously um, women would benefit from too. Um, but it it can be, certainly be understood. As something beneficial to men, um, and um, and the criticisms from the left side of the Democratic Party, you know, even you know people we normally love like the Squad and Jamal Bowman and you know people like that, the criticisms were um, 
you know, this, um, it, the, and from within the White House as well, you know, there was a lot, lot of this discussion from within the White House that um, infrastructure is for white men and, um, you know, and, 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 and so, so, so we, like, again, as if that was a bad thing. Like yeah. the Tell my neighbor that. I mean, anyway, like you know, I live like, back in my neighborhood, which is like a working class, like PO, you know, person of color neighborhood, and like my my neighbor is this amazing guy who spent his entire working career building, you know, highways across the country. Right? I don't know. It is funny yeah. to hear it. So it's like, oh, it's white guys only. I don't know where if you've ever been on a construction site in your it's life so, in the first place. It's so right? absurd. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it's so absurd. There's no, there's nothing, there's nothing at all white about these jobs. Of and 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 it was. And, can I just jump in? It was never the case. Like, there's a bridge that crosses the Yellowstone, and it was made by a company from like Birmingham in like the 20s or something yeah. like that, right? Like, and it was because it was black labor was very cheap at that time, and so they were going across the country break, making bridges. So, but there's an anxiety about like universalism that everything has to be like particular, right? To like make it have value, and I think that that's a real problem that the left is having. And I think it's so we've imported more from liberalism than traditional socialist politics, but it's a big problem still. It is a big problem, and uh, I mean. Yeah, and and obviously, like the loss of manufacturing has been devastating to communities of color. Like mm-hmm. even you, you know, this is like uh, um, I mean, this is this is definitely not a white male problem. But at the same time, what is so bad about some white men benefiting from this? <laughs> you know, it's like mm-hmm. I mean, it's like we the left, we, like we need them as voters. We need them as part of our movement. Like, like the the idea that you know, as as soon as something might help men out, um, we have to um, you know complicate it and and critique it. Um, I think is um, it, it is part of how we're we're getting you know our own way on this. And so then people had to kind of re- then then the sort of left side of the Democrats had to reframe this. So care work is infrastructure. It's like well, how about care work is care work and also really important. Mm-hmm. You know, well, we could just let infrastructure of sound, you know, sound like what it is, and let some men think they might be getting something out of it, and that wouldn't be so terrible. <laughs> I 100% agree on that. I mean, just while we have you here, because it's an example, I want to, to sort of hear your thoughts on. <laughs> This is not a super concrete point, but it is something that I kick around, right? Uh, you know, again, growing up in the South, like there's all these kind of like idea. One thing that I, sort of frustrated me when I became a leftist, because I didn't, I, I was conservative for most of my younger life, and I became a leftist as I got older. I, I became a leftist when I started working. You know, I, I did yeah. my first con- my first okay. construction job, like really opened up some doors for me. Um, and look, this might be a personal thing. I don't think this needs to be the number one focus of, of, of what we're doing. But like, I think we need to sort of be a little bit more comfortable on the left, like, with excellence. And what I mean by that is there's a kind of tendency to, to fear that um, in the sense of like, I don't know, like we focus a lot on like really big systems that are like keeping people down. Um, but also rec- like, I think we also need to, in addition to being able to talk about those big systems, being able to celebrate the folks in the classes and the movements that fight back against it. Like, I think of somebody like, you know, Howie, like, you know, is talking about Roosevelt or whoever. I think about somebody who's way more impressive and is certainly on the leftist side. It's like Paul Robeson, right? Uh, like yeah. Paul Robeson, just like incredible athlete, scholar, thinker, you know, political mm-hmm. activist, um, who certainly was not, and, and I think it's a different, like, I don't know. I don't know if I would necessarily want to gender this and call it a left-wing masculinity, but it's the kind of value that I think we could be celebrating more because it's like yeah. Paul was Paul Robeson was somebody and for people who aren't familiar you know he was like the first black man to play Othello uh, he was a you know <laughs> incredible running back at Rutgers he was a lawyer he was an incredible actor baritone singer um, and he yeah. fought against Jim Crow like you know at, at, you know pre like the massive civil rights movement he was a communist um he you know was incredibly articulate and passionate against the fight of imperialism and he gets brought up in front of the house of un-american activities and he gives the most defiant speech at a time when people in this country black people in this country you know really really um were completely unsafe to be you know showing political opinions and and, and fervor like that um anyways the point about robeson is like this is somebody who is like a great individual, but was always rooted in the collective too. Yeah. Right? And I just feel like we can try to build and articulate those kind of 
um, ideas and, and, and images for people because that's very attractive. And I think that yeah. while for some people being able to talk about systemic stuff is very attractive and I understand that, like it was you know important yeah. for me becoming a leftist, but I think it's also important for us to say like, we have like, a, we create a lot of greatness. The working class yeah. is great. These social struggles yeah. are great. And like, we should be very comfortable sort of celebrating that too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, I think that's, I, I think, I think that's really right. And, and that, um, you know, people need models of how to yeah. be, you know, like, it's like, if you look at, um, you know, again, like if you look at little boys, like, you know, like, like as you know, I have been doing over the past 15 years of raising one, you know, it's like, like you look at how they look at coaches, mm-hmm. you know, that, like, like they will just like, they will just like, you know, some coach who's like, you know, gassing on with like all these like motivational like cliches or whatever. Like, you know, they will just like listen raptly to that because they are looking for examples of how to be, you know, like how, like, and that's, um, and, and, you know, I, I think that you're right. We do underestimate that. And it's sort of considered a little, like cheesy on the left to have heroes and, you know, to, um, look up to people, but it's a, it's really, um, an important part of how we become, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. and I, mean, I think talk about, for struggle too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we talk about Christopher Hitchens so much, like both David and I uh, came up on Hitchens and it's like, <laughs> not, the greatest, <laughs> not the greatest example at all. Uh, but it's clear that like young men, they, they, they love him, man. I mean, like, he's... It's so true. It feels yeah. like, like, he was vaguely Marxist, right? Like, he get, like he's more appealing, but young men, they do need that model to show, like, oh, you can yes. be sort of well-read and uh, interesting to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that, that, is a, that is a great example because um, I, 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 I think it's kind of funny how... Um, much um men focus on uh, on christopher hitchens um because like i because i knew him and yeah. and, and he's a, and he's a um and and i uh, like i obviously like admired his writing a lot despite the bad political turn that he took um but um but but he's like he, he didn't really contribute that much as an intellectual, you know, and, you know, he didn't, you know, you couldn't really in many ways say um, what his contribution was, but I think you're absolutely right that he provided um, a, an example of a way to be, a way to be mm-hmm. a leftist and uh, like um, at a time where um, there were really not very many leftists, you know, and, uh, you know, and a way to uh, articulate, and a way to sort of um, be an atheist, uh, you know, at a mm-hmm. time where you know where where there where, where people were also really looking for that, but uh, but also yeah to um, to to be like an an alternative um, way to um, to be a man. I think it's it is really um, interesting how much um, 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 men men do focus on him, but I I think that it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we need to just continue building the roster basically. And, and there's plenty of people. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, Liza, I really appreciate you uh, joining us uh, today and people should definitely check out Liza's writing in the nation and Jacobin and all of their, and their work, frankly, anywhere you can find it. Uh, thank you so much. Hope to be able to do it again sometime. Thanks a lot. My pleasure.
All right, folks. Uh, welcome back. Sorry about the little stutter that went on with the uh, software there. Uh, yeah, the, the one thing you don't want to happen uh, in a pre-recorded interview is it all of a sudden be like, Whoop. no, yeah. just nothing's going Especially out. because we're in the other room. Like, <laughs> Exactly. I'm trying to eat the chicken sandwich. Um, <laughs> exactly. Y'all don't know. I mean, I love doing it this time so we can hang out with y'all, but it is funny. Like, we just, like, work straight through dinner. Um, uh, both of both of my show times, I were I worked every single lunch yeah, right. for the past like five fucking half a decade. Um, That's true. <laughs> um, yeah. we don't have to do it every night here, but yeah, no, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, South Dakota education update. Mm. Not my home mm. state, but south of it. Uh, let's talk about South Dakota, folks. So Kirsty Nome has been busy, but first let's do uh, Sioux Falls Stampede had a little halftime entertainment. Now, uh, I love, I, I believe Sioux Falls is a minor league hockey team. Um, and uh, I love minor league hockey. Uh, even like pr- uh, pre professional hockey is interesting. And uh, obviously, college. Um, I don't know much about the game. But anyway, mm-hmm. here's a video. Uh, another one of these things where it's like, oh, this is kind of fun, but also really, um, you know, I feel like we've. We've came to the point where we know that this is bad, uh, at least on Twitter. And so this, so this is like that example of, well, I mean, every time NBC News is like, this child in Louisiana did a lemonade mm-hmm. uh, stand to, pr- to pay down for their brain cancer. It's like every, everyone it gets ratioed, right? This is the, in that thing. Um, just in an arena in South Dakota is holding a dash for cash where teachers get on their knees and fight for $1 bills that they can use for classroom supplies while spectators watch and cheer. So they put like about, yeah, five thousand cash, and uh, five thousand dollars between ten teachers. So, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it's it's as despicable as it gets, frankly. Yeah. So, um, what what I find uh, interesting is just to put this in the context of some other priorities we've been having from Christy Nome. Uh, so in, uh, January, Noam sought $900,000. So, um, I don't know the math of how how much times 9,000 is over five, but lots, I think, um, Mm -hmm. $9,000, uh, um, to, uh, revise the U S history curriculum. And in July, she signed an executive order that, uh, uh, banned the South Dakota Department of Education from applying for any federal history or civics grants. She said it was CRT, but any federal history or civics grants. Again, this is a she did this as an executive order. She could have just told the head of the DOE, "Hey, don't do that." But she wants to get on Fox News and make a show of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have um, uh, let's see what's oh yeah the but the but what we, what is being really left out of the curriculum here is I think interesting. So Christy Noem, the the quote was, "We want to show why America is the most special country." This is literally what she says: "The most special nation um, in the history of Earth." Right? This is like fundamentalist um, uh, talk. Um, I have a, if you want to put up this thread here mm-hmm. from um, let's see, I got it right here. Yeah, statement from Chairman uh, Harold C. Frazier regarding the South Dakota Department of Education's uh, uh, removal of curriculum regarding the history of our indigenous people. And I think it's worthwhile um, reading through this a little bit. You get, you'll, you'll, you'll see the point. Recently, a work group was convened of more than 50 people who were reasonably who were responsible for this year's review of drafting social study standards for South Dakota schools. This group included educators, post-secondary representatives, parents, and representatives of business and industry. The group put together an unprecedented curriculum designed to teach about the Lakota people, how our history has intertwined in our present day situation. Unfortunately, those bureaucrats and politicians who commissioned the work group gutted the portion of the curriculum regarding our indigenous people. There is so much that must be taught to the children. In or- yeah, this is, it. this is it. There's so much that must be taught to the children in order for them to understand the world they will inherit. And it begins with understanding one another. Like, I honestly think you are doing violence to people when you, mm-hmm. r- when you forcibly remove them from this historical inheritance. And which is, I will say, the violence that is par for the course for this country has always been the case. And only now we have the ability to maybe try to confront it a little bit. Removing the important lessons. Oh, go ahead. You want to say something? No, no, keep going. Um, 
Uh, removing the important lessons of who we are, where we came from, and why things are the way they are robs everyday young minds of the necessary understanding to overcome the hurdles of conflict, genocide, and historical trauma. Uh, if civics is truly to be taught in South Dakota's children, then I remind you that today that the doctrine of discovery is how you justify your behaviors and that article six of the constitution states the laws uh, shall be made and then goes on to um as uh uh, uh tribal spokespeople often do uh, take us to task for our uh inability to uh follow tribal uh for, for old treaties and what what this basically amounts to is nine hundred thousand dollars and I, look this may be reductive i don't care nine hundred thousand dollars for genocide denial Right in the context of, yeah, and here's some more. Our children, were, uh, our children were stolen from us in a past generation, forcibly assimilated or secretly buried in boarding schools under the "kill the Indian and save the man" ideologies. And it would seem that the task to erase them has not ended under Christian leadership. Absolutely, and right. you know, I was just reading another thing about um, uh, uh, a bow usage, um, bow and arrow usage, and there's a ceremony. Uh, 20th century, 19, like oh five or oh six or something like that. And in order for, uh, native Americans to, uh, I think these were, uh, Lakota folks, um, to get, uh, a land parcel or something like that. They needed to, they participate in the ceremony that was photographed where they shot their last arrow and then put their hand on a farm plow. Right. Like, oh, the, Lord, yeah. right. And it's like that, that's, that's this country. And that mm -hmm. is, that is, we talk about like cultural genocides. We need to talk about the land we're on. And again, we're seeing right now this like massive, um, ideological discipline freak out that is, uh, and I mean, the, the only hope panic, is, yeah. the only hope is that maybe this is like making this stuff, um, you know, the Streisand effect it's make, it's going to make kids seek it out. And like, I hope, uh, you know, be there for people when they seek that stuff out. Um, mm -hmm. I guess is, is, is for some people that are plugged into like left podcasts, like that's like, that's like a, you gotta be stewards of this sort of history. No, I, I think you're hundred percent right. I mean, it's just, it's just interesting. And I don't know the, I mean, I know a little bit of the history, obviously of the Dakotas and, and specifically like the Lakota. Um, but it is interesting just like, seeing what other the other ways that like republican governors and and sort of like right wingers sort of treat native americans and like that history in other parts of the country particularly like the south like you know what it, it's just it's an attack on identity and a history from all sides so like in this context this is known like quite literally just trying to like like erase frankly the vast majority of of dakota history right like the history of south dakota through this um and in, in in a way that's just extremely blatant um while in other southern areas like they they teach like native american history but it, they tr teach us like what they call like prehistory right and there's like a lot of like ideological work that's playing in there where like white people especially will try to like act like oh they are like the embodiment of you know certain kind of tribal values but they you know they're the actual like realization of that merge with like white civilization right and it's a really 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 nasty ideological um project um but it can happen like in a, for example like in the carolinas when there has just been centuries upon centuries upon centuries of you know genocide and, and forcing those people away from their homes and it's not like the dakota's like genocide has been um you know less extreme it's just it's more recent that there's more of a need right now for them to just outright deny uh, that history yes. yeah i mean the 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 way that the um like maybe the first concentrations caps of the dakota in minnesota um like basically right at the mouth of where the uh, mississippi and the minnesota rivers uh you fly over it if you fly in a minnesota airport mm. um there's pictures of like what predates um like the Boer concentration camps like the, wow. the um a, a, like a crazy photo actually um you know maybe we'll, uh, we'll try to bring that up sometime but it, it it's like all these teepees in a very enclosed space and that was actually like they're like before that was the first concentration camp it's like one of their like um like sort of like not, like uh, like a mecca type place where like the, like uh, of deep theological significance and mm -hmm. you know like and, and this stuff and and then the but the but i guess to circle back to the way that that is taught expulsion of the dakota is 
like um is like well kind of both sides got a little bit violent and uh, particularly <laughs> let's stress the atrocities from the indigenous folks right mm-hmm. and 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 it doesn't and it never really until like relatively recently and still in fits and starts still in the you get some good history from people that fundamentally like won't use the genocide word right like but the and 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 our understanding of this is it's so incomplete and it's uh, but it's mm-hmm. it's like it's I guess it's it's there though it's there if we can get it to people and that's why uh, sorry but that's why there's this freak out because um, now is the time for that sort of reckoning and, uh, and we I need agree. to have it. No, I hundred percent agree. I mean, you know, just on that, I mean, like, there's a problem that I think like a lot of like liberals have with talking about you know Native American tribes and and like in a way that like so obviously there's like the kind of conservative erasure, right? Um, but then there's like a humanity erasure that some kind of liberals do when they talk about these histories, right? Where it, like, instead of telling the fact like, you know, these were groups that were in conflict with each other and like in war, like bad things happen. Right. And you can like very clearly say like, you know, the Lakota or the Comanches or like the, you know, the Cherokee were very justified, um, in fighting back against like Western or like, you know, American, you know, invasion of, of their lands. Um, but they did fight back. I don't know. Like there's this kind yeah. of like liberal paternalism, which is like, Oh, these like completely peaceful groups, um, you know, had all of these things happen to them when instead what we should be able to do is embrace like the actual history of like groups were fighting back and sometimes fought that fight back included like brutality um and and understand that as like another terrible cause and and, and effect of this kind of like expansion of warfare um I, what i'm saying is that like it's certainly good for uh conservatives and, and the vast majority of the public to like read and understand these kind of histories and movements you know what i mean matt um but also i think a lot of liberals too because they have this kind of flat view um that like what it does what that kind of thing does the reason i think is a problem other than just like historical misinterpretation is it's like like you're evacuating other people's humanity right Mm -hmm. your land gets taken from you you've seen the atrocities happen to you you lash back out that's human and when you like deny people like the, the their history of struggle and fight back um, I think that that is like a, you know, th- that only adds, I think, um, you know, to, to, to like the kind of travesty of the way that a lot of people learn this, this history. Yeah. And I think you're right to point out the sort of liberal reductive version where that you basically like isolate the trail of tears and Andrew Jackson as a sort of like Trump. And it's like, gosh, wasn't it bad that that happened? But he was just like explicit again about the, like the business of this country, like that, mm-hmm. that sort of, those sorts of expulsions, like he's just like uh at, at, like at some point there was like it's pretty crazy actually that that period of time like the bourgeois thought was get, did get very liberal and it was like you know the abolitionists and stuff like that like they it, ultimately you see like it's not it's fundamentally like and uh, to get to slavery like going to be slave mm-hmm. uprisings as much as it is like people publishing in boston um but um <laughs> But it's stuff, no, it's I mean, important to have that publishing available, like um, to be there for folks when they want to make like this, like the tribal chairman said, uh, a spokesman said, it, their sense of the inheritance of our, our place in the world that we got. Like, there's mm-hmm. nothing more fun, spiritually important. We talk about the crisis of meaning with Josh Hawley. Like, there's nothing I think more important than understanding that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, and like. Uh, it's something that's sort of denied from a, a very kind of basic understanding of history. I mean, like here in Texas, like, you know, amongst many other, you know, tribes, like you have the Comanches, right? Who are some of the most fascinating, one of the most fascinating groups in, in history. I um, mean, you know, there's a great book, Mancheria, um, which makes a very radical argument that pisses a, a lot of people on like the liberal side off that the Comanches were an empire. Um, but if you look at any kind of contemporary um understanding of what an empire is an empire is a state that demands payment and tribute from smaller and less powerful states well the comanches certainly fit that criteria because the british the americans the spanish and the french and then the mexicans and then the early texans um all spent time where like the comanches would come into your town and you just give them your shit because you knew <laughs> if you didn't like there was going to be um a havoc and, and a lot of hell to pay you know that's not a clean and beautiful history i mean that's a very but, violent one and you don't you shouldn't also like you shouldn't go so far as like you know just glorify the violence in and of itself right because it's brutal stuff i mean you know terrible terrible things but it was an empire it was an extremely powerful political force and historical force that existed very very recently 
Um, and in fact, like the Comanches, like great heyday was actually in this period of, of like Western expansion of, of the United States, um, and you know, of the kind of cementing of like Mexican power. Right. So like, so the point is like, this was actually like a very specific period of time when there was this great power, like native American empire in a time when like a lot of these other societies were like on the back foot. Um, and frankly, it was only the fact that after the civil war, you had like the entire American community, the entire American society. So militarized that they were able to turn those forces, you know, against the Comanches and other folks, as, as, as you know, Matt. Um, well, say, yeah, same with cool. the Lakota and Dakota up in, uh, in, yeah. uh, in the North Great Plains, right? Like but that's the post Civil War. Stuff. To, like understand that like history of like glory and, and, and strength too. Um, but I don't know. Like it's just something I feel is really important because like I think when the people who watch the show for the most part, like they, you know, they, they trend left um, and, and that's good. So they understand the plight of, of, uh, of Native American folks. Um, but I think it's also important to be able to like kind of celebrate those, those also triumphant moments and don't fit into like the way that a lot of liberals feel like they have to like see a group like that you know what i mean um as just sort of like peaceful but wise you know groups who are just sort of you know victims of like the the, the movement of history versus the fact that um the, the the general moral argument is very simple i mean genocide exploitation um and invasion right um but within that there's just like there's triumph and power and like you know there's there's a whole world out there and i think that like if yeah. anything when we talk about history that's something that you and and I try to like express to people is like, don't do flat history um, because you miss all of these really fascinating and important. These are people. This is their life. This is people's history. Right. Um, you know, yeah. yeah. And you also like, yeah, that's, and you, you, you also can't forget like um, the germ element to this, like particularly sensitive time to talk about this now during a pandemic, but like, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's really what, um, got the ball rolling to any place is mm -hmm. um germs taken out uh uh, uh tribal people and then uh, like and it's funny that you mentioned the, the comanches like daniel boone regularly shaken down when on his long hunts and that was just part of the thing right like he yeah, fucking like, knew like the, the, the toll you have to pay you know? exactly like like they signed like some deal with uh like uh, um one tribe but like the cherokees didn't um like sign that shit so it's like uh or the shawnees didn't sign that shit so it's like uh, boo knew like all right fine take the take the bear skins and that stuff and then we just gotta mm -hmm. hunt more um uh yeah <laughs> but, um that, and that's a yeah it's a, it's really i think important to know because uh those i i mean we talk about this stuff sort of stuff all the time like <laughs> whenever there's wildfires for instance it's like we're clearly mm -hmm. not doing something right um with regards to our relationship to the earth um in this very even specific area um yeah no and, and i think that on top of that i mean it just makes what gnome is doing absolutely despicable so like if you ever want to remember how uh, you know the, the fact that history can be a weapon this is a great time to you know to make sure you're diving into it and and, and supporting outlets and, and groups that are sort of telling that history especially in the dakotas and you know south dakota is such a funny example of both these two things because on one hand you got mount rushmore uh, just an mm -hmm. absolute abomination <laughs> um, in, the uh, Black Hills. in the Black Hills. And then you have the Crazy Horse Memorial, uh, which is like a well-meaning version of it. But at the same time, like he, it's not celebrated by like Lakota people. It's like that was another yeah, it's like, a Polish guy who did who did it. Right. Right. And, and like doing it. And like I, I, I'll say like experience on me was probably the positive version of that. Like I thought like, that's pretty dope that there's this alternative version. Um, mm -hmm. even though it's not as completed as the, as the Mount Rushmore, but like, again, like who's making decisions. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the black Hills of all places. Um, yeah. I mean, Which for people who don't know, it's like one of the holiest sites, um, in like the Lakota religion. It's like the, the beginning of the world, you know, and just a mountain we, oasis we, like, in the we middle of that and put fucking Roosevelt's face on. <laughs> it's, 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 like, it's truly, it, 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 it's really an amazing bit of nature. Yeah. Uh, like sort of like mountainy away, not like, not like, um, you know, white caps, but like mountain oasis in the middle of South Dakota or in the Western part mm. of South Dakota. And it, and like, that's pretty, that's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah, I'm definitely as a North Dakotan jealous of that. But um, I mean, it's really I mean that a gold rush in the Black Hills during a financial crisis in the 1870s is why Bismarck uh, is where it is, where mm. it went when it was uh, put where it was. So yeah, we should no. probably do the, uh, get, move on to Sanj now. 
No, but we, we could do this all night. We should we should get a whole episode on just this kind of stuff because it's really important. Um, and I know it's important both you and I, and I think our audience too. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, we've done this many a time. I talked about this yesterday on the show, uh, but this is a very clear and, and, and simple moment, frankly, uh, when it comes to forces. About good. Like a lot of times the world is very, very complicated. There's nuance, et cetera. This is the clearest day. The United States government is trying to punish, torture, and humiliate a whistleblower and a journalist uh, for exposing American war crimes, crimes of the highest extent in America's imperial inve- adventures in the Middle East, right? Assange is being tried and targeted um, for bringing the crimes of the American government to light. The United States is trying to extradite him on extremely dubious charges. Remember, Assange is not an American citizen. Uh, when this happened, this was not he was not in the United States of America. Um, and the United States government is trying to charge him under the Espionage Act, right? So which is something that even like the most like kind of right wing freaks recognize as a law that is one of the more anti-democratic statutes that they have um, on the books that they can throw at somebody. Right. So it would be bad enough if it was an American citizen was happening in the United States, um, you know, whatever charges they're bringing against them, whatever activities they're accusing him of. Um, it would be bad enough if this was an American citizen, but this is a foreign citizen somebody who was not doing um, engaged in these activities inside of the United States borders. So what this is, is like a kind of general threat, not just to American democracy, but to the globe, right? That if you do something that embarrasses the United States of America, we will use the powers that we have, right? Um, through our massive military, but also through our massive financial and political power to bring you to the United States of America um, to face charges in this country. I mean, it is an extreme affront, um, not just to uh, American democracy, but to just like global sovereignty, frankly. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like a lot of these countries have, uh, I think the UK is one, um, uh, but like that, these these deals where we don't uh, extradite to countries that, uh, for instance, torture, <laughs> and mm-hmm. there is absolutely reasonable uh, a suspicion to believe that Assange is going to face all sorts of awful, awful conditions that other countries would not accept, um, and on top of the ones that he's you know had to deal with for years already. Um, but yeah, that it, like the the message sent to anybody you you expose us, we'll bring you here and f you basically. And 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 note that like the United Kingdom, um, you know, they originally said they will not extradite Assange to the United States because um, they felt that bringing him into the United States and facing the American <laughs> justice system um, would be a threat to their human rights, right? Which is as big of an indictment on the American system as as you can get. Uh, so it, again, this is one of those things that it's very, very, very clear. And I think that people need to be a lot more vocal and upfront um, in their support of Assange. I know this has been a long, drawn out process at this point. So it might not always be at the top of everybody's minds, but this is, you know, this, the, this attempt is coming to a head. Assange just recently faced a stroke. And people should also remember all the context of things that have been going um, along with this. Assange has had American, um, you know, CIA officials essentially threaten his children recently, um, you know, say that they've been tracking him, his children, um, and his partner, right? This is not some kind of... uh, uh, you know, this is not just a limited to like the courts, right? This is like an entire security state that is using yeah. their resources to threaten, again, a publisher who exposed the fact that the United States was engaged in torture, the fact that the United States was engaged in mass wanton killing of people, um, right? Things that you should want to be brought to the light of day if you are a citizen of a democracy, right? Whose brain has just not completely melted. Um, this, again, this is a very, very simple call. Um, and it's something that fascinates me that there are so many people, I think I have to say track record on this socials are pretty good at it because they recognize the stakes. Um, the progressives, um, very, very hit or miss. And I think this is a very clear call that people can make that this is not frankly, like I hate when people say this, make this kind of argument, but like this really is not left or right. Frankly, this is not this party or that party. This is not this faction versus that faction. This is, do you think as a citizen of a very powerful country that the actions of this government um, should be brought to light 
so that we can decide if we want that done in our name or not. That if the government is lying to us, that people will come forward and make sure that we know the truth, right? Do you want to live in a society where that um, is what happens? Or do you want to live in a society where people um, are who expose atrocities by this government, have their names dra- dragged through the mud, are tortured in front of all of us, all while people basically say that they deserve it? Um, we'll get to the 2016 stuff in a second, but yeah, I, I just like I think this is a very simple call, and I wanted to shout out some people and call out some people, um, uh, unless you had something else to add. Yeah, no, I think on top of like the the progressive folks, it, it, I think like like Greenwald and Co are right to call out like the Guardian and folks that, that made so much fucking hay from disclosures <laughs> yeah. to like not and to that they were saying shit during the Trump administration because at that point the history was Obama had sort of backed off I guess and then Trump had ramped back up so it became a partisan issue again and then now Biden is I mean that's the way to make it you know if you want to like have a lib uh uh lib uh a family member you could try to maybe get in with that way like obama did this and why is biden doing the trump thing but um, i i frankly don't think that's <laughs> at that point you know um but but yeah like i i agree with your uh your overall I mean, uh, you know and it has to be said i mean um you know obama really really uh did um ramp up you know uh abuse and of uh abuse and and um targeting of, of whistleblowers right yeah and that's something that you should be very you should take very seriously now i'll just say this because it's the internet and i know everyone gets into like the internet squabbles and there are people for sure who have like try to make this into like a very weird cottage industry that like they're like the people who want to present themselves as people who care the most or they're, they're the only people who care about um you know the assange stuff and i can understand as somebody who like you know we, i've been talking about this ever since we've had a public platform right um and and i've been advocating for us to cover this as much as we can um you know in addition to all the other things that we cover right um so it could be a little personally annoying for me when some people are like bro you know are, are you saying anything about assange i'm the real true like you know free assange guy and you're not but you know frankly the the, the solution there's simple it's just to be loud and bold enough and upfront uh, uh, enough about your support for assange and against this kind of uh, you know attacks on whistleblowers so they have no leg to stand on like that's it like as and then you don't have to care to be, because what happens i see sometimes on the progressive left especially people in the media is they get annoyed at some like a segment of like online like characters right who try to act like they're the only ones who recognize that this is a problem yeah and they actually let it get to them to such a point that they fail in a moment like this to say free assange right which is yeah. that's ludicrous you need to have a bigger spine than that if you want to be talking politics on the tv right um but um beyond that i wanted to know two things first shout out this is a shout out we haven't done shout outs in a little while but um I want to shout out some shout out a lot on the show um ilhan omar um you know maybe not as early and as, as adamant as i would like it um but here she is um she's tweeted you know earlier today on the show medi hassan again it's not a perfect character either but it's bringing this to the msnbc audience and we're not going to play the clip but in it medi hassan says you might not like this to the audience and we're going to get to msnbc more in depth in a second um but anyways ilhan right here comes out very clearly and says on the show medi hassan makes the case for why the prosecution of assange is indefensible give it a listen I think that's great that uh, Ilhan is standing clearly with Assange there. I think that the rest of the squad should join her. I think Bernie Sanders should join her. Bernie Sanders has said things in the past. You know, it's not like people are silent on this, um, but this is a clear moment right now. And it's the Biden administration. You were talking about it when it was Trump. Let's talk about when it's Biden, when you have a little bit more of his ear. Uh, The silence has been very, very worrying, I must say. Um, But let's get to one last thing, because... um, I think that this is important and it's something that ever since I got into this kind of role, um, I think for the most part, our audience f- feels one way um, about this now, but this Russia stuff has been such poison. It has been such poison to journalism and, and democracy. I'm talking about this kind of liberal delusion about this kind of mass grand conspiracy that Trump was not created by right wing domestic reaction, um, but actually actually some kind of you know international um, plot um, you know to put him into power. Right again, Assange is not 
um, being investigated and charged for this because of the leaking of Hillary Clinton's emails back in the 2016 election. Right. Um, so anybody who starts, whenever you start talking about Assange, if somebody starts talking about that, you tell them right now that is not what he's being brought up for. Right. Um, and, and, and if they continue to go on it, they don't know what they're talking about and they're like willfully being ignorant. Right. That being said, even if he was um, being charged for exposing what was exposed in those emails, which was that Hillary Clinton and the DNC and all of these other characters were actively rigging a Democratic election. That that still would be wrong for him to be charged and to be attacked for. It. Um, but I just want to go here with everything that we know now about Russiagate and all this kind of stuff, that there was no meat on the bones, that this was a huge excuse for very powerful people to start ta targeting um, smaller outlets. I mean, look, I was one of those people who was put on those dumbass lists of Russian agents out there, right? A kid, you know, you know, working uh, week nights and weekends at a bar to get by and blogging for like small left-wing <laughs> publications, you know, somehow like involved in this grand Russian, like this has real consequences. And, you know, obviously it's personal for me on that level, but for people like Assange, like these consequences are, at their height um and there's not been a reckoning with this and this is msnbc um just this week refusing to sort of recognize like the role that they play julian assange extradition could mean even more legal trouble for donald trump right <laughs> and <laughs> wow well, well. i know and it's an opinion piece of course but you know this matters um you can go and is it because msnbc opinion columns, frank for glizzy you go through this entire piece, um, and they're talking about Assange um, and uh, you know all the things that they don't like about him. Um, and it takes a while. Um, uh, here we go. For them, so it takes a while for them to even set up again. Because sorry, the reason I bring this up is because if you are a, just an MSNBC viewer, right, and this is all that you sort of get, this is how you get your information, you think Assange is being brought up in front of charges in the United States for tilting the election in Donald Trump's favor by, you know, exposing these, you know, these emails, right? And it, this is why I think it's it's so, it's, it's, it's malpractice as a journalist, again, to start off a piece with this much text before you get into, um, look, this is all the text that we get into until they finally admit, though, oh, yeah, by the way, Assange is not <laughs> um, being charged for exposing Hillary Clinton's emails. The charges against Assange concern whether an organization that exists primarily to solicit and disseminate illegally obtained government secrets can be considered a media organization entitled to the First Amendment, Amendment protections. I'll answer that question right now. Yes, they can. How is it not, um, you know, media operation to try to distribute and disseminate information about activities of the United States government at war, right? Yeah, you're only media if you have en enough uh, lawyers. You're, yeah, you're only media if you spend enough time in J school learning how to fucking lie um, and, uh, you know, basically regurgitate uh, press releases. Um, again, so they finally say they are not based on WikiLeaks publishing Democratic Party emails hacked by the Russian government in support of Trump. In support of Trump. Again, exposing Hillary Clinton somehow means you're in support of Trump, which again, I find to be completely ludicrous, right? Because there was no punishment um, or a real reckoning for what happened with, with that was exposed in those emails because a whole segment of the American population basically saw blue versus red, right? Um, again, anyway. Um, if the Department of Justice plays its cards right, it can make the case precisely about those Russian government hacks and WikiLeaks dissemination of the content of those hacks by offering a deal to Assange in return for what he knows. How amazing is that, Bubba, right? They're talking right here about how the case has nothing to do with their insane fantasy that they've been pumping for the past five years. But maybe, just maybe, the United States government can threaten Assange with torture, can threaten Assange yeah. with maybe potentially never seeing their family again, so that they can get Assange to go out in front of Congress, right, and say, oh, the 2016 election, we were the, we were the factor behind it, right? That should worry Trump and his allies. Mueller wasn't looking for collusion between the 2016 campaign and Russia, but on provable evidence of a criminal conspiracy with Russia to affect the election. While Mueller did find that Trump and others met with Russians at the Trump Tower because they believe blah, blah, blah. Can I just, the, yeah. If this was in Pravda during like the show trials, they would say <laughs> this was like trying to coach people on what they should do to get a uh, good out outcome. Right? Uh, like that's right. So like uh, Assange, play ball here just give us some shit on trump 
uh, maybe, and uh, then maybe, I don't know, maybe Uncle Joe will give you a par- uh, pardon or something after uh, some time served. Exactly. No, Assange may be able to close the gap between collusion and cr- criminal conspiracy. Again, there is no uh, evidence at this point. Look, look, Trump sucks. And there, I have no doubt about it that Trump like does not care enough about American democracy as a concept to like not, you know, take information from from foreign governments to sort of aid his campaign, right? I'll even give you that. But the fact is, is that this kind of Russiagate story, right, has always been about one thing, explaining the fact that the Democratic Party, um, why the Democratic Party lost a layup election against yeah. a candidate, again, that was, you know, put up, was encouraged to be elected by the Clinton campaign, right? They were running interference to try to get Trump to become the GOP nominee because they thought he would be a slam dunk. And they lost against them because they're completely out of touch with the American voters, right? And then you create this insane ideology that, oh, it's not our leaders out, that are out of touch, it's not our Democratic Party systems that are out of touch. To, you know, the game was rigged. Um, so again, and it's been proven time and time again at this point, time and time again at this point, that there is no meat on the bones of that. Right? I mean, we've devoted, I mean, we've devoted years at this point. You know what I mean? If there was something, it would, it would really have exposed itself right now. The only people who are still holding on to it is this kind of MSNBC liberal, um, you know, class that has made such a career out of selling this lie, they have to continue acting like they're, we're just a week away. You know, is as delusional as the people who are like, Donald Trump is going to become elected, pre- you know, it's going to be sworn into the Oval Office on like December 30th. You know, we got the date wrong last time, the time and time before. Um, anyways, let me just read this last paragraph and we can zoom out. Um, Assange may be able to close the gap between collusion and criminal conspiracy. Assange got the Democratic National Committee data dump from an entity long suspected to be a front for the GRU. Of the Russian military intelligence service. In fact, WikiLeaks actively sought them out. Why? The Mueller team indicted 12 GRU officers for that hack. But what did the candidate Trump know about WikiLeaks, Russia connection, and when did he know it? Right? Again, the hope here is that they can sort of paint a narrative um, and, and tell a story that, again, we're just this close to the final revelation about, uh, you know, about Trump 2016, which is... Um, you know, it's, it's, it truly boggles the mind that there's still appetite for this kind of stuff. Um, but beyond it just being something like, oh, this story is wrong, right? Um, this, this story is wrong. This delusion is bad for our politics. It's dangerous for this country because it's now made in a whole bunch of people's minds, people who did not support the Iraq war, people to, who did not support President Bush, right? Um, it, in their mind, it has turned somebody like Assange and movements like WikiLeaks that were trying to expose war crimes done by the American government, but also done by the Bush government, um, to try to make it seem like the guy who is exposing the atrocities done by the American government is the bad guy um, because he didn't help out your, you know, because he hurt the, you know, he hurt the electoral chances of your favorite person in 2016, Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's extremely, extremely delusional, but it's also extremely dangerous. Yeah, and I mean, I think. Look, I don't, uh, I don't, I have beef with WikiLeaks going back to the ClimateGate stuff, but even to put like publishing those ClimateGate emails in like 2012 or whatever. Important context for that is that stuff really took off when the New York Times covered it, and that was before mm-hmm. WikiLeaks republished it, right? But like I, I say that to say this: even if you're so poisoned from this organization, from that stuff, which is frankly a difference in editorial decision like uh, making, mm-hmm. um, and I don't, uh, and like I, I think you can't, you got to understand the over, like the systemic free speech stakes here, uh, and it, like, like that's, I think that's that's really all, like, that's what makes this open and shut, like it, it doesn't really matter Ain't nothing else really matters i'm sorry like i mean i'll just say this like at wikileaks like <laughs> obviously you making you're making decisions about what kind of thing you're trying to find and what kind of things you're putting out there right i don't think that wikileaks is sort of actively has been actively sort of suppressing like bombshell information that they get but i'll tell you this right now like Assange doesn't share my. I don't share politics with Assange. with assange um I, i've listened to many like interviews with him i mean 
a really fascinating and funny one um, to watch is him, uh, Slavoj Žižek, and David Horowitz, of all people, right? Um, you know, it, it shows that, like, yeah, there are, I have certainly have very serious political differences uh, with Assange, and the vast majority of people who are sort of tuned into that WikiLeaks um, project, from Snowden um, to even Manning at times, right? That doesn't mean I think they're bad people. It just means, like, you know, we just don't share the same. I don't find them as members of my political, like, party, but my socialist movement. But for fuck's sake, I absolutely um, respect and understand them as, as people trying to get some some truth and information out there, right? Yeah. And you could be mad about what kind of information maybe they're – like whose information they're exposing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's information uh, nonetheless. I mean, unless, you know, we're really talking about things that, like, don't have any veracity, um, I think sometimes getting super precious about, like, oh, well, why did they not expose the RNC's, um, you know, emails versus the DNC's emails? Um, instead of saying, like, okay, well, we've, we've got some information here that is very helpful from some of the most powerful people in the world right this is not just like a you know small group of people who just happen to have like their personal e emails exposed this is a political party in 2016 and in, in regards to the democratic party um you know that had every reason to think that they were about to be in a position of of having you know senate presidency um and and, and uh the House of Representatives under their control had somebody who they effectively privately anointed into that position and then actively worked to suppress like the legitimating factor to them, which is like the, you know, the election, the democracy aspect. And that got exposed. Look, Trump's a threat. That fascist far right thing is a threat. But if you don't think that that's a serious thing either in this system, you know, you've, you've got rocks in your heads, man. Well, <laughs> and then who's up? And then whose arms did Democrats run into? The FBI, who, by the way, like James Comey yeah, that's true uh, too. said, she, like, we're going to uh, investigate her. If anything had a bigger, the FBI yeah, had a bigger great. effect on Hillary losing than fucking Julian Assange did. And yet we, like, I have to know who fucking Robert Mueller is uh, besides some guy who entrapped a bunch of Muslim teenagers into fucking terror charges. Um, yeah. Same with James Comey. That's, I mean, that's what the FBI has been fucking really doing. Um, like, <laughs> our, our, it looks like we've, yeah, all these fucking spies and and all this crazy stuff turns out we should have been in fucking dearborn um you know like um uh filming care meetings like yeah <laughs> um i think that's 100 percent right well anyways i mean i know i went off there but it, it just it builds up sometimes because it just to me it's it just it's so shocking because i really do think this is just this is a simple ass call um, free Assange, happy to see Ilhan stand with, um, with him in, in that movement. I would hope to see more uh, backbone yeah. from other members of the progressive movement. I mean, even just generally, honestly, after the, uh, the, the amount of, I mean, we got to get to the post game. We'll I'll talk about all this stuff more there. Um, but the, uh, between Nancy Pelosi saying, uh, I will trade stocks, motherfuckers get out of my face about it. Um, it Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> uh, the build back better going, uh, uh, I mean, what am I forgetting? Um, um, I mean, there, there people are floating. Uh, Clinton, oh, Hillary Clinton loan. again to make uh, Hillary yeah, Clinton's Clinton going back. To student loans. We want a smooth um, to transition back to student loan repayments. Um, I think, like we, we would circle back to those conversations about um, the squad needs. Like, if the squad is going to be sharing um, uh, small donor cash with uh, those motherfuckers, then we are going to be starting saying, do not donate to the squad. It's mm -hmm. going to have to be independent socialists and stuff like that, because that is uh, that like, what are we getting? What's what what's been got? Like we had like a few weeks where we could pretend we're still going to get the bill back better. Now it's going to be oh we're going to go really hard at voting rights. Joe Manchin doesn't give a fuck about voting rights. <laughs> no, I mean that was the funniest. I mean, we got we're, we're going to bring this energy in the post game, but I just want to know like the funniest aspect of this is to sit here and say. We can't like fix the bumps in the roads, right? Like keep it simple, <laughs> stupid. No bumps in the road. Remember that from TMBS? Um <laughs> Flew back. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. we should bring that back. I told I, I told Chuck Schumer if I hear Bernie say the billionaire, the billionaire, one more word. No more. <laughs> anyway, well, we'll get to all that and stuff um, in, in the post game. But I gotta say, like, the fact that we couldn't do infrastructure, which everyone always says is the most basic, you know, thing in politics, everybody wants to get these things fixed. We couldn't get that fixed, but somehow they're going to aggressively start fixing voting rights. Amazing to me. Um, no, I agree. I mean, it's it's hard to it's uh, we have to find a way um, to deal with the, that disappointment of that party and that organization and not turn let that turn us into depoliticized and, and a hopeless movement too. Yeah. So we'll talk about that a little bit in the post game. I think we got Musk. Then we got a few other things. We'll be taking questions as well. Yeah. Um, and plus this weekend. 
Um, you can sign up at Patreon. Well, I mean, slash. gotta take the Lenin view, right? Like that's, yeah, I think yeah. that's, that's really what helps you become not depoliticized. This, I think that sort of, um, that level. Yeah. Remember Lenin was somebody who saw, you know, first this initial revolution, you know, which seemed unlikely for him, you know, the 1905 revolution, which seemed unlikely for him five years before it happened. Then that happens. It's like, okay, well, great. We've seen like a kind of like basic, movement towards democracy in this country but still a country dominated by you know still the czar and old system but also a growing capitalist class oh well, i'm not going to see anything happen in my lifetime you know to then being somebody who um you know at the end of their life was sitting in the uh, only workers republic in in the globe right yeah you always have to remember that the world can be very bleak but it can move very quickly um, but we'll be talking a little bit about lenin this weekend on bonus episode patreon.com slash left reckoning we'll be talking about lenin's writings to the american working class you know there's always people who you know are sort of on the fence about being able to you know afford to support us feel free to you know shoot us an email too we can always find a way to make that that work for folks uh because we want to make sure that this stuff is as accessible as possible um, also plus you can you can come in under the suggested prices too and still get the yeah. stuff yeah and um on top of that uh i think this week at two we're gonna be putting out a listener census so uh be on the lookout for that too so we we're hit we're close to 50 i mean it's been a year of this project now and want to hear what people think that they think we've been doing right, what they think they'd like to see us expand into, and and much, much more. Uh, so for all those folks who will be with us um, in the post game, we'll see you about, what, 15, 20 minutes? Yeah, I'd say 20. Um, cool. See you all soon. And, uh, see you, folks.